Are you tired of riding an emotional roller coaster every month? As a woman, I get it. The Women's Wheel is here to be your emotional anchor. Understand your cycle and discover the archetypes that resonate with your unique and dynamic emotional landscape. Together, let's find balance, strength, and a sense of ease through the changes. Head to womenswheel.co to start your journey of self-discovery and emotional empowerment today. All right, so I've got uh, Zach back on the podcast, and uh, Zach and I were just going to catch up a bit in preparation of Origins uh, that I'm super excited to be attending. Um, so we figured might as well turn it into a conversation. So I got like a couple of uh, list of things to chat about. Uh, I'm sure Zach has a few on his own, too. So yeah. uh, first off, how's it been, Zach? It's been wild. Been 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 crazy busy, but uh, I'm, I'm super excited to be back on. So thanks for having me. So uh, I know last time uh, we were chatting a bit about the transition to the new uh, kind of white labeling um, convention yeah. circuit business thing. So how has that been going? Yeah, it's definitely going. Um, we've got, you know, like I think the answer there is we've got several really cool clients that have come on board. Um, Medithias being one of them that's been a client of ours for a couple of years now. Um, and Cubicle 7 being a new one as a couple of examples. Um, so, you know, we're excited. Our goal this year is to hit around 20 trade shows uh, mm. and, you know, spread the message of a lot of cool RPGs while we're at it. So That's very cool. So these trade shows, is it, is it something that Wagdi World of Game Design is always at in addition to this new... Um, so I forgot the name of it. The, tabletop the Fanatics. Web. Yeah. Tabletop Ta Fanatics. Thank you. Yeah. So is it usually Tabletop Fanatics and World of Game Design? Or is it just so, the 20 goal is just for World of for Tabletop Fanatics? Yeah. So think of think of World of Game Design as like another publisher in our line now um, of mm -hmm. clients. And so the I think there won't probably all 20 shows World of Game Design will have a presence at in the sense that there are number one. Uh, they're our oldest client and, and, and the one that we're closest <laughs> with. Right. Um, but, but uh, yeah, I would say like tabletop fanatics will be at the 20 world of game design will be at, I think right now the slate is all but one of them. And, um, one of, or, uh, and, and one of them is one that uh, tabletop fanatics is basically being hired on to consult for another mm -hmm. Uh, group so it, we're already doing a show that weekend so we can't we can't go to both in in force but we're gonna send a consultant to that one okay well so the only uh convention or gaming convention i've ever been to is origins yeah so how would you say that one compares to the ones that you usually do so origins is kind of like a nice middle of the road um there's a lot of shows especially local ones that and i'm sure you you have a lot of these types of things down in, in your area too but uh, there's a lot of shows that are local that are like a thousand people or less, right? Mm. Um, and so I have a handful of those local here in Kansas City. Troy has some in his neck of the woods. Jared has some in his neck of the woods. So we do the local shows kind of as a one man band or as, you know, like the local team tackling it. Um, and then there's a handful of shows that are what I would call like the, the beginnings of the mid sized. So anything from like, 5,000 people to 15,000 people um, and the top end of that being Origins. And those are typically like board game shows or tabletop shows specifically that have diehard fans and are all over the country and are just fun for us to go to because it's like speaking directly to our people, right? Like, um, and Origins is kind of on the upper end of the mid sized and then we have the big ones so the big ones origins i think i think origins was sitting around like 15 to twenty thousand, typically um as far as count wise i think a couple of years ago it was a lot smaller than that kind of around the pandemic but in 2018 i think it was pushing up against 20 and we're i think they're pushing back up against those numbers again um 
once you go above that, then you really start hitting big. So like Gen Con is a hundred thousand people. Um, wow. you know, uh, 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 New York city comic con is, you know, push and double that. Um, and so that's kind of the range of the big ones. But once you go big, you're kind of a, um, it's really fun and it's chaotic and it's all those things, but you also realize that not everybody that comes to a big show is your people, right. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way. And so you're, you're not fighting for a hundred, you're not targeting a hundred percent of the market basically that's there. You're targeting, you know, the, the five or 10 or 15 or 20% that, you know, are coming because they're interested in the types of games that you're, you're bringing to the table or in the case of a Comic-Con, you know, most people are coming to a Comic Con to, you know, get signatures, attend cool panels, meet the celebrity, you know, things like that. And, you know, the exhibit hall would take hours and hours and hours and hours to walk through. So even if it was possible, you you not everybody's gonna walk by your booth um you know, over a course of a weekend. It's just not it's not feasible um for their schedules or just for the the packed, dense sea of people that is a big show like that. So if you're thinking of it as like uh, as if you're just like counting sales, would an origins result in more sales than a New York Comic Con or no? Um, I think that it's going to vary from person to person, group to group, of course. But I would say that like for margin wise, you're probably going to have the best margins at targeting local conventions to you that are very much in your wheelhouse, right? Mm -hmm. So for us, as an example, like we don't do craft fairs because that's not really in our wheelhouse. But if there's a local con within an hour and a half drive from me, that's a gaming con. It's probably going to be stupid cheap to get a booth there. You're not going to have any hotel expenses. And, you know, people like supporting local. So you'll see great margins there you just won't see high numbers of sales mm -hmm. um, once you go to like an origins or the mid-sized ones are sometimes the most dangerous because you have all of the a lot of the expenses of a big show like you're 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 traveling to another city so you have a hotel expense the booth expense is probably close to the same probably not quite but close to the same you have all of your expenses for a booth right banners and backdrops and yeah electricity mm -hmm. and you know yada 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 um, but your sale, you're talking to, you know, there's instead of a hundred thousand people, you're talking to 20. And so I always say like the mid-sized ones are the dangerous ones where you need to bring your A game the most because they're the hardest ones to make a great profit margin on. Hmm. Um, Interesting. And then the big ones are a gamble in their own right, right? Because you still got to bring your A game, but if you bring your A game and you present well, you know, there's a lot more people and you stand to do pretty well, but it, it, you know, it is a juggling act, but I say you can't go wrong doing a local show. Um, it's, it's hard to, hard to say no, but definitely the big ones are the ones that make, make it feasible to turn it into a company. So like where I am, I know there's a dice tower con, which I don't think they've had for a few years and that's in Orlando, I want to say, but uh, let me look that one up again. Dice Tower Con and see if they're doing that thing again. Dice Tower East. Oh, it's happening in July. Uh -huh. mm, maybe I should sign up for this one. Dice Tower uh, is you... a yeah. yeah, Dice Tower is a board game company. Uh, like they do a lot of like videos on YouTube. They they make a lot of like mm -hmm. how to plays and reviews and things like that. Uh, I, I've never been to Dice Tower East, but um, yeah, I mean, like that to me would be interesting to like, I would look at it if I were in your shoes and it wasn't too far away. Um, yeah. And because you got a lot of games at this point and a lot of yeah. you got several board games, you got the, you know, the card based RPGs and then you got yeah. regular tabletop stuff. So I think for a board game con, there's a there's a fair chance that. that I've only got one board game at this point, but I'm hoping to have my next one prototypable in time for origins uh -huh. so maybe in the unpub room or something but i i i mean so the events for origins haven't come out yet so it's right. like i really have no idea how to plan my time there <laughs> yeah yeah so, I have, um yeah. i've never gone to a show and just attended and, and not been a heavy participant so um uh, yeah, you, you and me both, like I would not know what to do with myself with a whole weekend of conventions to figure out. 
Well, so like, it, it's, I mean, th this is all easy for you because you've been doing this so much. So maybe easy is not the right word, but it's all experiences for you. Like you, sure. you, you generally know what to expect, what to prepare for, what kind of lists you need to check off. And so like the idea of introducing another convention into my lineup is scary. Uh -huh. Um, but that being said, it's not like I'm going to origins this year as a vendor. Right. Um, so the first time I did it, it was an attendee. I met you. I did tons of events. Uh, I participated in tons of events and I had a wonderful time. The second time I didn't participate in any events. I just hosted that one that yeah. I met you at and I was a vendor. And as a vendor, you don't really have any free time. Yeah. Yeah. So this time I'm thinking it's going to be more like the first one. I want to I want to do more role playing games and less board games. And part of that is because if I'm like, oh, my God, I need to buy this. It's going to be a lot cheaper and it's going to take up a lot less room than a board game. Yeah. Would. <laughs> yeah. Like <laughs> at the last one I bought, I bought this uh, chip theory game uh, from called Burn Cycles, like 140 yep. bucks. Mm -hmm. I bought it because everybody was like flipping their shit over this game. I still haven't made it past the tutorial. <laughs> it's a beautiful it? game i haven't i don't i don't have it now i um it, i i realized really quickly that as much as i adored the art and the presentation of it like it's not a it's not a game that my family would play and that's kind of my gaming group so um uh, but but i am i'm i'm super interested in it and it's, it's one of the coolest looking games that came out last year like it just yeah looks awesome it's like thematically it's it's kind of like a um a little bit like Metal Gear Solid, like you're sneaking around these robots that are like on preset paths. So you have to try and avoid them. But then you're also kind of like programming your movement to try and like predict where they're going to be at a certain point. Uh, and it's incredibly complex just from that tutorial. And I just hmm. I haven't uh, forced myself to do it. Part of the problem is I uh, I really like the games from uh, Forgotten. Uh, sorry, not Forgotten Realms. Um, uh, what what is this called? Whatever the Polish com Awaken Realms. There you go, yeah, Awaken yeah, yeah. Realms. And a lot yeah. of their games are like super long campaigns. So my wife and I have been playing ISS Vanguard for like forty sessions now, and we're not done yeah. with the campaign. So it becomes really hard to introduce a new game to the mix because like we're so close to finishing this one. <laughs> But <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, yeah. So Awaken Realms is a very fascinating company. You know, they own Gamefound, and that's right, where yeah. they do all their stuff. And it's they're they're, they're you know they're, that's a that's a type of game that I think is so freaking cool. Um, but I feel like if I was going to get into them, I would have to like pivot completely away from RPGs and into that to find the time. Um, What's funny, too, is I got into board games because I didn't have time for RPGs. And now board games have become like RPGs where you have to do the next part of the adventure. And I'm I'm missing the freedom of being done after two hours. Yeah, yeah, that's the like my 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 family gaming circle, like my family loves like hour long board games. You know, and we can have some complexity, but we want to be we want to be able to play three board games in an evening. Mm. Um, and, you know, that's fun. It's a great it's a great time. Um, um, and I like it because it's it's you get to learn. You get to play a lot of different things if you want to. Right. Like you can learn a lot if you're going to play three games in an evening. Um, and that's kind of the way I like to adjust my RPGs now, too, is like no long campaigns. Let's just do like 10 sessions or less in something and then play something else. Um, so I can I, we can experience everything that's out there, at least try. So like some of the games that we've been playing lately, when I say we, it's my wife and I mostly just playing like two player games. We recently played um, one that I got from Kickstarter. It arrived like two months ago called Steam Up. It's about collecting dim sum. It's really fun. Ooh, that's cool. It's very that's simple. You've got like little plastic steamer baskets stacked up. The game has a lazy Susan in the middle of it. And part of it is like rotating dim sum away from your partner so that they can't get their like the set that they're trying to collect and then rotating it towards you. It's very simple, but it's really fun. It's got a little squishy uh, like bow buns and stuff. And it. it's quite delightful. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, that sounds like a blast. 
Um, it reminds me of, oh, uh, there's a game, it's called, like, uh, something's brew, like the lizard, like, brew or something like that. Anyhow, it's, uh, maybe the wizard's brew, and, and it, you know, there's this big cauldron, and everybody's, like, like, adding things to it, and you're trying to brew potions, and uh, you're trying to upset other people's potions. Anyhow, it's, like, like <laughs> yeah, I love that sort of, like, fun Probably. themes just hook me hardcore, so. Yeah, I, I worry I'm going to show up with too many games when I come back from Origins. Well, anyway, so I'm just super excited about Origins. So. <laughs> Tell me about some of the events you'll be hosting down there. Yeah, so um, let's see. We're going to be doing a panel. I'm going to do a panel on my own called um, um, How to Teach People RPGs. OK. Um, and it really comes out of my YouTube channel where I teach people RPGs. Right. And we do how to mm-hmm. play videos. And so we're going to I'm going to sit down and say, hey, like, if you're like me and you're a game master who wants to introduce your home group to game after game after game, and you don't want to turn them off, or you've had the experience of saying like, well, I just bought more pork, we should play it. And everybody turns (laughs) their nose or you just bought ISS Vanguard and you set it down at your game night table. And uh, you got halfway through the tutorial and they're like, this is not going to work. Right. Like, (laughs) um, Mm -hmm. so like that's the sort of an idea is like walking through, how do you how do you introduce people to a game and and teach people a game in a way that is most likely to uh, connect? And then um, we're gonna do we're gonna do a geeks camp panel, which is our podcast where we're gonna just do a game master Q and A. Should be fun. Should just be like a raucous, silly, good time. Mm-hmm. Um, we're gonna do a Zwei Honda panel since Zwei Honda is our big RPG system that we picked up. Um, so we're gonna do one called Let's Talk About Zwei Honda. Um, and we'll talk about new news, upcoming products, um, our third-party support program, things like that. Uh, we're going to talk about Hannibal, which I know you felt a little bit on with some mm-hmm. art. Um, but we're going to talk about where Hannibal's at. And I think that panel's called uh, First on the Scene uh, with the Hannibal RPG. Um, and then we're doing one called The Business of Gaming, which is uh, uh, kind of an evol I think it's kind of a pseudo evolution from the Kickstarter panel that I've done for the last two years. But the mm-hmm. idea behind it is just, you know, what are some techniques and pathways that you could take to take your hobby or your small indie publication and turn it into a business that's sustainable and that, you know, pays bills, pays rent. Mm. That sounds like uh, a lot. Is are these events that you're like that you'd only do at origin size events and above or do, or like the smaller local ones usually not have a lot of panels. The smaller local ones usually don't have a lot of panels. That's accurate. Um, it really depends on like, I just had a conversation this week with a local con and I said, Hey, what do you, what do you guys want? Right? Like, like, you know, your show better than I do. What do you want us to do? And they're like, Oh, well, if you could do some demos and you could do a couple this, that, and the other, and then they're like, and we have this private room set aside where you could record things. And if you want to do panels in there, that's great. And to me, I looked at that and I said, you know, we're probably not going to see a mountain of people attending those panels at the local thing. But if they have a private room and it's nicely laid out, nicely presented, and if we can get a handful of people and if I can record it, then sure, let's do a couple of panels. Why not? Like just add some variety to the mix and give them something else that they can put on their show schedule. Um, And, you know, if I'm recording it and releasing it in the wild, online afterwards then you know just as good as what we're doing here it's just uh in a different place so uh, uh, one thing that i've been wondering is like since i'm not going to origins as a vendor as chain assembly is there anything that like i should be doing networking wise that i'm not that i don't know about i guess it's a dumb mm. question but like i don't think i don't so, know because i learn <laughs> stuff about that all the time um so one of the things that you can do is um a lot of times there will be manufacturers there um, so like long pack or something like that, that it's worth at least chatting with them. If you, especially if you know what your price points are for other things, you know, talking to manufacturers can be a good time. Um, the other thing is, uh, uh, I find it very valuable and that's how we met, right. Is going and saying like, mm-hmm. who's making things similar to the way, the things that I make and how are they presenting and who are these people? And, um, getting to know that like like getting to know your peers like i continually say that like 
good peer-to-peer relations is the easiest and cheapest marketing you will ever have um, for a project. So the more people that you can, you know, say like, hey, I know the guys at Bloat Games or at, um, you know, Skeleton Key or at Infinite Black, or at, you know, these smaller companies. I say small, they're still like cool, legit companies, but like they're, they're you know, they want to connect with you and they would love to chat. And so playing in their games or chatting with them at the booth or, you know, chatting with them at the booth of it, going to dinner afterwards or f- finding them at the bar later or whatever. Like these are fantastic ways of just building that out. And uh, that's, that's where a lot of our connections and revenue and marketing has come from in the past few years is just, you know, being nice and being friendly at shows and connecting with people that, are nice and friendly and want to connect back, right? Um, that probably um, one thing, uh, another piece is um, Origins is one of the shows that does this. If you go on Wednesday, um, there's Trade Day, um, which is uh, basically a time where it's just publishers and retailers and vendors kind of intermingling. And so anything, if you're a publisher, a small publisher or whatever, you know, that's an opportunity that you might have to touch point with some other, with some retailers or, or folks like that. Uh, I definitely think that once you go up to like Gen Con and things like that, it's that re- trade day is definitely a, a, a very viable thing. And I think it can be at Origins too. All it takes is, and all it takes to make a good show great is connecting with two retailers, right? That want to take your stuff. Um, so... I would say like that's a good thing, and I I love honestly I love your idea. Like my favorite thing to do at conventions, if I have time at all, is attending panels, and then <clears throat> following that up with can I play thirty minute up to two hour demos of different games that I've been meaning to try or that catch my interest. Um, and yeah, walking home with not just a, a trunk load of games, but a trunk load of experiences and like learning new mechanics and new interesting things like. Like to me, that's that's super helpful because then I go back and I'm like, all right, like it's interesting how this company solved this problem of initiative or combat or whatever, um, and that typically helps me with my game design. So, so one thing I hadn't even thought of that you just made me think about is like, should I be bringing copies of Ready Play Games or Pilgrimage of the Penitent and try and like reach out to, um booths that represent game stores and see if like they'd want a sample you can um and and i'll say like we definitely facilitate that like as, as somebody who consolidates you know a lot of indie publishings and different published uh different publishers and tells them like i definitely have people come up to the booth and they say hey i have this product um and i'll say like it's you know it's not unheard of for me to buy it right then um mm-hmm especially if it it's a one to one match for something that I'm already selling right like if if I'm selling pil- uh Morkborg stuff and you come up with pilgrimage um as long as you know your terms are right and you know we and 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 your terms are right and you have it right there and I like it like I've been I've picked up you know 10 20 copies from a person who just has them carried around in their backpack right um that's definitely happened. I would say that, you know, carrying at least a few, I, I will definitely admit to sometimes I'll be out on the show floor or w- walking to and from a seminar panel or at a seminar panel. And I get to talking with somebody about something I'm like, oh, do you have one of your games on you? And I'm like, gosh, dang it. No. Right. Like it would have been <laughs> like and that would have been so easy to have done. So I would say like at this point, I'm always think, trying to hey, make sure I have cards, business cards in my bag and, you know, a product or two. Um, just on the off chance that even if I'm not intentionally finding those conversations, you never know when, you know, the person that you're playing a board game demo with, it happens to be in a, a game publisher and like, or a retail store owner. And you just happen to fall into that. And you're like, Oh, if, mm. I, would have, if I had the games, I would show you, but I left them all mm. at the hotel room or at my home or whatever. So a few, so, I wouldn't take everything, yeah. but so, okay. Maybe like, Uh, ready play games for example they're small should i be giving out like free copies to people and be like hey here's this 
here, you know, here's two of this series. If you're interested, contact me uh, and yeah. we'll do a wholesale order. I think for or, retail, that's it's always it's always um, reasonable. That said, my typical finding with retail is that retailers know what they want. And you don't really have to sell to them that heavy. Like <laughs> if, if as an example, like more pork is something that you and I both are comfy with. Um, if I go, if I'm talking to a retailer about different products and they're like, I don't know anything about more pork. Even if I give it to them, they're not going to buy mm-hmm. it, Right. Like they're just, they're just like, they aren't in the know about that side of the uh, 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 community. But if I say, hey, we got all this more pork stuff, and I've definitely had this happen on numerous occasions, I'll, you know, a retailer will be like, I'll take six of everything. More pork sells, right? And and it's like, right. well, I didn't need to give away anything at that point, right? Like I mm. just I just needed to to put it out there. So I would say typically when I give away product, especially to retailers, it's typically about like, hey, they're buying a bunch of my D and D stuff or my mothership stuff. And I'll say, like, hey, I know that you don't know if you have a more core community in your local area and you don't really know about this since you're buying a bunch, let me give you a couple things and you can test it out. And if you like it, great. And if not, no big deal. And for me, that's like, okay, well, it's already a win. Cause I, you know, I'm selling $400 worth of stuff. I can afford to hand it off. Uh, I do find that retailers um, and this maybe wouldn't always prove true, but typically retailers will either be buyers or they won't. They're either they're either legitimately looking and have the cash the cash flow to purchase and they will buy at that point or they don't have the cash or aren't really interested and it doesn't matter how much incentives you throw at them they're just probably not going to pick it up. Hmm. So maybe um, it would make sense then rather than bringing like a bunch of copies of stuff to give away for free, just bring stuff to display and carry them on me. So yeah. like for me, that would just be the um, couple of ready play games and a pilgrimage of penitent book. And then just have like, if you're really interested, here's I already made a whole bunch of flyers that describe each of the ready play games yep. and say how to contact me for wholesale orders. So I'll yep. bring that. Yep. And then I'll just have a copy of pilgrimage of penitent. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I think that's how I would do it. And, you know, just, and then my typical thing is like, you know, if, if I really connect with somebody, a retailer just really, and I, and I hit it off and we're at a bar or we're, you know, at a board game table or whatever, I'm perfectly fine with giving them a copy of, of, a, mm-hmm. of a zine or a thing at that point, because they're not at the booth. They can't buy right there. And I want them to, and I also, I'm like, you're a cool person and I want you to, you know, remember mm-hmm. this. So, giving you this is a little bit of an investment into this relationship. That's a scenario where I would give it away. If it's like a happenstance meeting, Mm -hmm. not at their booth, not at my booth, not in any official capacity, but I want them to have something more than a business card. Then yeah. Yeah. A a product is mm -hmm. great. Well, one of the biggest differences in this regard is that you're already going there with a whole bunch of merchandise (laughs) and I'm going there with just, a, a, a loosely packed suitcase with the expectation I'm going to fill it with shit. I'm bringing back. So okay. I really need to kind of figure out what to pack and what's not worth packing. And you know, the other cool thing that you can keep in mind is if you'll, if you'll ping us and this is a little bit of business chatter, but this is all business chatter. If oh, you'll yeah. ping me before, before, you, you know, tell us, you know, Hey, you're coming and what shows you're coming to this year. Um, I'll make sure to throw in some of our stock of your stuff and. Oh shit. Yeah. Right. So then you can just <laughs> be like, a, I didn't even think of that. that fanatics booth and you can buy their buy my stuff there right uh or at well, least check well, speaking it out. of that speaking of that do, is there any benefit or would you want me to do like a signing of any of the stuff that i have there yeah i don't so, know if that could be an event or something there, there's definitely like there's value like what one of the things that i think we could do a better job of as a company but but definitely already shows value is anytime you are working a booth and you can tell a potential cl- customer that the creator is here or you're the creator, mm-hmm. they are exponentially more likely to buy. Right. Mm. Uh, and so is it, is it, you know, is it, is there likely to be a crowd for a, a Zach Goen signing or a Nick Rivera signing? Probably not. No, but, but the fact that we, you know, you had mentioned, Hey, Nick's around, he's going to be stopping by the booth on Saturday morning and he's going to be at this panel on Saturday afternoon and he wrote this book is probably a very valuable 
sales tool for everybody that's that's repping, you know, your stuff throughout the week. It, it, so that that's kind of one of the topics that came up with John Baltisberger when I had him on the podcast was like, I've also noticed that too, when my wife is helping me at art events, where like, if I say, hi, I'm Nick, I'm the artist, it kind of like brings me, this sounds shitty, brings me down to their level. But if it's my wife saying, oh, this is my husband, he's the artist, that kind of puts me elevated. Mm. It's weird, but it's, it's I love just a psychological thing. No, no, no. That's a, <laughs> that's a very cool. I remember that episode, actually. And I, I remember like, like yeah, that's a, actually what an interesting concept and an interesting experiment. Um, yeah, I mean, like, it'd be cool to like do a case study, you know, and, and <laughs> do like one sim one one booth where you only ever are introduced by your wife and see what the sales are as compared to it, yeah. it's just you. Um, but yeah, I, I 100%. Like we, if we have creators at the show on location, sales go up. So mm -hmm. that that's a given. Um, well, speaking of which, whether, do you know if there's yeah. any other, so other than you and I, are there any other creators that you know are going to be at Origins? Oh, yeah. Um, I, and I hesitate That you to represent. Say, <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh, gosh, let me think about this. Um, there's several mothership creators. Um, so like uh, Greg Harris and um, uh, um, 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 probably shouldn't be snapping up the podcast, but uh, <laughs> uh, Greg Harris and uh, I'm, I'm hoping to get Joel Hines and Eric Alzador and a few people like that. And from their side, um, we represent, you know, at several shows a year, uh, the Vascrum guys with Brian Collin and Infinite Black. Um, and he's going to be there. Like there's, there's I, I really haven't like we've got a few shows in between now and there that I'm more like, you know, trying to take stock of who's all there. But mm -hmm. I have heard from Origins is well attended in the creator space typically. So, yeah, I have high hopes that quite a few of our crowd uh, will make the track. So if you did try to, like, publicize a schedule of sign of creators at your booth ready to sign stuff, would Origins be mad at you for, no. like, not making an official event? I don't think so. No, no. And do you think there'd be benefit to that? Like just having some type of sign on like a, an acrylic yeah. little standee that says like these people will be here from this time to this time. 100%. And exactly. Honestly, like that's the sort of thing that I think that I'm eyeing as far as like things to improve and whether it's a signing, I think a signing is, is the, uh, it adds something additional. Right. But even if it's just <laughs> a, a sign that says these products creators are here. Mm hmm right um is probably enough for most people just because that is a conversation starter if you like more quark stuff and you're looking at all of it and you look at this little you know acrylic standy next to it that says these these more quark products creators are here and it's pilgrimage and it's shackle and it's you know uh more cabians or whatever it is mm -hmm. to me i'm gonna be like Oh well, I'm gonna buy this, and I'm gonna take when I take it up to the register. I'm gonna ask if you know if, if any of those people are here, and I can get it signed or whatever, right? Like it's it's enough of a conversation starter. It's probably um, yeah. great, but yeah, yeah, I I think that 100 thing that one of the things that our booth we want to kind of heighten this year is printed non you know something that doesn't require me be standing there and telling you oh this creator mm -hmm. is here, but it's actually like you know, in your face as soon as you're at the Morkborg section or the Modifia section or whatever. Um, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that being said, you're talking about printed stuff. Do you have like a brochure of like all the stuff you carry? Because I know brochures were like all over the place at Origins. Yeah, so we, we do. Um, we're actually in the midst of updating it because <laughs> the, the crazy chaos of our scenario is as a consolidator, we're getting in, you know, half a dozen new products every month from other people. And so, you know, it's a question of like, we keep our web store pretty up to date with all of it. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of SKUs there. Um, but how, what do you, when you're building out a catalog, what of all of that do you put in? Obviously you put your own stuff in, but do you put in every client's, every single product? Or do you have a more org spread and you just say, you know, here's a list of all more quirk stuff. And here's a few images mm -hmm. you can go to the web store. Like, like, you know, there's a lot of yeah. considerations there when you're building out a catalog uh, at that point. 
Well, you know, like with board games, it's kind of a, a tradition, I guess, that you buy a game from a publisher and inside it is going to be a little pamphlet of like all the games that are upcoming and stuff they have available. Yeah. And a lot of times what we'll do is we've definitely done that. Well, another thing we'll do is we'll like with a zine, especially we'll put up a, a, a page or two, save a page or two in the back, especially if we have a couple of pages, because, you know, there's you have to print a series of four yeah. or eight. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, well, if we have a couple of extra pages, like, well, let's put an ad for a couple of things in their back. Mm. Right? Like, um, it's and a good nobody, idea. <laughs> I don't think anybody I've never heard anyone complain about having you know, a 48 page zine where two pages are in the back are dedicated to promoting product. So there's, there's this one role playing game I got from Kickstarter that was, uh, obviously, I mean, honestly, kind of shitty. Uh, -huh. uh, I don't know if you saw this one, the Hieronymus one, uh, based on the paintings no. of Hieronymus Bosch. That's cool. So, um, you know, I think for this, I'm going to turn off my, uh, fancy background. Sure. Um, if it lets me switch. <laughs> uh, oh, I can't switch cameras during a recording. All right. Just because the fancy background makes it hard to see shit. But what's cool about it is like the the Hieronymus Bosch paintings are. Uh, let me find one presented as maps. Yeah, that you can travel through. Uh, OK, so, yeah, there you go. I can kind of see it, I guess. So it's like they put a yeah. grid over it. Yep. Yep. And I can then see like that. different location stuff. And one other thing that's kind of cool about it is I don't know where these are, but the character sheets, they're very simple, but they are formatted as bookmarks. So it's just a long, narrow oh, thing. Okay. Yeah. And it's got like all the things you fill it out yourself and your character sheets a bookmark, which is mm. great if you have a copy of the game as a book, you just slip your little sheet in there. Uh, yeah. But this was terribly printed. It like bows like crazy. Oh, it's like and a POD copy or something, or just a cheap copy in general. Yeah, I think it's. I don't. It was just a bad idea to make it long and narrow. I think. Oh but, yeah. <laughs> but anyways, I really liked the idea of bookmarks being a character sheet. I thought that was uh, probably the coolest thing to come out of that role playing game. I backed like, the that Kickstarter. Be, yeah. One of the dumbest Kickstarters that I ever backed. And I say this dumb in the most <laughs> endearing way possible, right? Like, yeah, it's like dumb in the sense that I did not need to back this, but I wanted to tell them that they had a great idea was um, somebody made all all of the old school essentials RPG classes into bookmark character sheet. Oh, lists, right. Nice. And so literally the campaign was buy it. We give you the PDF. And if you pledge at like ten dollars, we'll send you some printouts <laughs> of them. And I was like, that's cool enough. It's such a great idea. It's so like, they're so compact. Like part of it's just that they're extra compact, not even that they're a bookmark, mm -hmm. just that they figured out a way to make them more compact. I'm like, yeah. I'm going to give you enough. And, and literally they just sent me like printer paper prints. <laughs> you know, they're I literally could have printed of it two seconds at my house. But, but, but I was like, you know, like what a, what a great, like anything that can get smaller and more compact for me, especially because I travel to all these shows, like I, 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 I love the concept and I'm super supportive of it. So one thing I do, uh, I am going to I decided I'm going to do at Origins is like for this podcast, um, I'm going to be using my camera, my my uh, mirrorless um, micro four thirds camera. I got a nice, really mm -hmm. flat 18 millimeter lens on it. And uh, I've got wireless uh, lapel mics that attach yeah. to the camera. So I'm going to be going to different booths, ask them to I'll, I'll just for my own notes, record their business card, ask them to say what booth they're in or what space they're in, describe their business and say what they think is going to sell out the most quickly. And I'll mm. do that for like 10 or 11 or 12 or so vendors and put that all together on TikTok, on YouTube and as a podcast. Mm. And if I can get that all done on the first day, I think I'd probably get a ton of hits because I know when mm -hmm. I was at Origins, I was Googling, like, what should I look for at Origins? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that could be good for the podcast as well as give me some views and it'll be nice content, too. Yeah. Yeah. That's a cool idea. Um, uh, we had a we've had a couple of people that have done like that sort of like shotgun approach to doing little podcast recording. And I actually find them. In fact, like really charming to listen back to, not not my own, but, but <laughs> listening to other people's, because it's cool to have like the background ambiance of like mm -hmm. the crowd and all of like it just it, it's a cool feel. I really dig like on location podcast recordings are 
super fun. Yeah, I'm I'm nervous about it, but we'll see how it goes. And if I find someone cool who wants to just hang out for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever, I'll have my laptop and I'll again, I'm going to have those wireless mics, which I can attach USB-C to bring to the computer. So those will be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I didn't do anything last year because my wife was changing professions and trying to save money. But like, I, I feel like... I feel like a chain assembly kind of staggered a bit or was a bit stagnant last year because the crowdfunding campaign that I worked so hard towards and put on backer kit didn't fund. So it's it's weird to like see that I didn't have any income from crowdfunding in like four or five months, which is totally unnatural for me. Are you ready to paint your own canvas in the real estate world as a homeowner? It's Leslie Haas from Realty One Group Sunshine, and I'm here to talk home equity, your masterpiece in the housing market. Imagine owning a piece of property that's not just a place to call yours, but also an investment opportunity. It's time to take that brush and start creating equity in your dream home. With interest rates on the verge of dropping, get ahead of the curve and secure your artistic haven before the next rush. Whether you're a first time home buyer or upgrading your studio, let's sketch out your home ownership dreams together. To learn more, visit Tampa Bay Homes for Sale dot real estate. You would, you would are you interested? I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to open cans of worms that, that you've already buried in the backyard. But um, do you, would you? Are you interested in talking about backer kit in general? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so this kind of all winds back to um, two people I've had on the podcast. First is. Uh, um ellie melissa mascaro she is uh, a person who i met through someone who went to my booth at a metaphysical event and they loved my tarot stuff and they're like oh you got to meet my friend ellie she's a somatic sexual healer and she's a massage therapist and life coach so i met with her and she had this really cool idea for something that's like a tarot deck but it's not just one person. It's like activities for a group of people. And it's based on this philosophy she's been developing of how women's cycles mirror the seasons and they transition from archetype to archetype throughout this seasonal change. And Mm. uh, I really loved her idea. And I'm like, hey, I know how to like make things like this into physical products. Let's get this done. So we worked on it together. Very proud of what we put together. And it was around this time I was also doing the podcast and I met with Seven, who wa- had the highest funded tarot project in Kickstarter history. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I learned a lot from them. But Sarah- Seven at this point was transitioning over to using Backerkit for crowdfunding. Mm-hmm. So Seven connected me with the marketing team on Backerkit and... Um, uh, I had never used a marketing team um, other than you guys, uh, mm-hmm. which is not i don't think you ran facebook ads for me or anything did you it was mostly just no, the email yeah, list. let's be let's be clear like we dabble yeah. in certain things but but we don't consider mm-hmm. ourselves at least at this point a marketing agency we right, right, right. Yeah. We're, so so yeah i'm i'm mm-hmm. fascinated by this yeah. yeah 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 so i was looking forward to it the people i spoke to were great i had like three people on our team they took a look at our project um i did all the graphics for them uh, they created A and B testing. They wrote all this copy, all these great headlines for everything. They gave us this like web interface that tracked the success of each individual image, each individual yeah. headline and each individual um, uh, copy, a uh, bit of copy for the ads that they were running. Right. And we decided to do this on Backerkit because if they do marketing for Kickstarter projects. They take 15% of each pledge that came from one of their ads. Right. Which seemed totally reasonable to me because it's like all the people we're bringing in, they're not taking any of that money. It's just the ones from ads that they've made. Right. Um, and then if it's on backer kit though, then it's 10% of each um, that they take of each pledge. Mm. And so I was thinking, okay, between that discount, and the fact that there's not a lot of projects on Backerkit's new crowdfunding platform, we would be standing out. Mm-hmm. We're like, oh, let's do that. Totally no brainer. We had our funding goal set at $7,000 and we only made it to about five. Um, 
and so well one thing that was uh that was too that was helpful too is it was very easy to communicate with these people they're like okay we're gonna spend this much money in order to lead to generate leads um to get more people clicking on the the pre-launch page uh mm-hmm. so we probably put like five hundred dollars into that or so didn't get a lot of leads we still owe that money because that's how much money was paid for kickstarter i mean paid on facebook ads uh, but they don't charge us anything on top of the money that was actually spent on ads. So like mm. screws them over because they did all that work for nothing. But at least we didn't lose out on money. So so let me let me get some clarification there. So yeah, sure. Because um, uh, oh, this is cool. Uh, like uh, this is exactly <laughs> the sort of thing that I want to talk about all day, every day. Um, yeah. So so they're they're basically. They're going to promote you to the backer kid audience. They're also going to build your ads. Uh, let me stop for- you right there. They do not promote you to the backer kid audience. Aha. Uh-huh. That, okay. That's they- one thing that really confused me because I'm like, oh, all these people are going to backer kid for Kickstarter projects and they'll just go in there for the, the fulfillment. And um, so I'm like, then they'll just come across our project, which happens to be on that. And I mentioned that to them like, oh, aren't how can people aren't finding us from that? And they're like, oh, we don't market. Uh, crowdfunding projects to people who come to backer kit for the fulfillment do they do they so so they're 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 spending the the marketing that they're doing is strictly going off site yes it's all facebook ads facebook ads and they're Mm -hmm. basically saying if you if you let us build your facebook ads and you pay us if you have five if you want to run five hundred dollars worth of ads and you give us five hundred dollars, we'll build the ads. And if we get any sales off those ads, then we get either ten or fifteen percent, depending on what platform you're running yeah. it off of. Right. And are they giving you like like I don't know, like I'm not expecting this, I guess, but but were they giving you like like direct visual insight to know that like your five hundred dollars was one hundred percent being spent on being forwarded five hundred dollars to five hundred dollars to Facebook? Yes. Yes. We didn't pay that money until after the whole thing ended. And that was all based on how much money was spent on ads. And we'd be able to see this information in real time. Like, okay, we're starting off at $30 a day. We're going to see what that looks like and adjust uh, up or down to meet the ROAS, which was a term Mm -hmm. that we all learned (laughs) during these conversations. So they were, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. They were incredibly open and public about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it was all just very disappointing from the beginning that the message of this project was very hard to get through in a static ad. Mm. Um, And I think that's really just an issue with the project itself, not anything they did wrong. Um, Mm. They were wonderful to work with. They were incredibly um, open to our ideas. They suggested some fantastic ideas that we didn't know about. But in the end, the reason why it didn't work was um, our project was a little too big. We uh, when we were now relaunching it on Kickstarter, we got our actual manufacturing costs for um, before is based on 500 units. Now we're doing it based on 250 units and Mm -hmm. we took some things out of the core set. So it's really just a book, the mat and the cards in a box. So we got our costs down to three thousand. Our Kickstarter campaign is now uh, requesting 2000 to be funded. Mm-hmm. And I have a lot more confidence that in Kickstarter, even though you're competing with way more things, you have an infinite amount more people browsing projects. Nobody's any- browsing projects on BackerKit. Right. No, no. There's no natural traffic on BackerKit. Um, mm-hmm. So do you have any metrics to show you like uh, uh, for the BackerKit pro- campaign? Do you have any metrics to show you? where that you, you said you, you you raised uh you know you didn't hit your funding goal but you got about five by the end of it mm-hmm. do you know where those backers came from that did back most of them were people from our list so yeah, yeah. so there like there 90 percent plus would you guess i would say maybe 75 yeah. percent from yeah. our list yeah um but like again, nothing to like. Backer Kit's marketing team has been very successful for lots of people, um, but marketing really requires that the project can be explained in a single message that people want to click on. Yeah. And the concept of this project is a little bit deeper than just one message. And I still have faith in the project because, like, 
my first oh, yeah. board game, Satisfy, is it it didn't do well on Kickstarter, but it has sold very well at markets because I'm able to explain it to someone. Yeah. And that's, you know, so like that's what I'm fine doing that with the lifetime of the project of this new thing that we're getting manufactured. But uh-huh. it's just it, it's hard. It's not really a clickbaity item. Well, and so like like that, that's very interesting. And by the, so so for, for your <laughs> listeners, I use backer kit all day, every day, and I will agree that they are very communicative. If you are sensing any criticism on my end, it's it's for certain products in their line, not for backer kit as a whole, as a company, because I think Mm -hmm. that they're some of the most responsive people in the crowdfunding industry. Um, Yes. Some of the most helpful. Um, So so they they have they have enormous positive aspects. Um, Well, One thing about the responsiveness is that their whole business is based on Pacific time. So that's kind of annoying. Oh, yeah. For (laughs) you. Yeah. You're Eastern. So it's yeah, it's it's a whole. Yeah. Um, and I start my yeah. day at seven. So, <laughs> oh yeah, so yeah, it's ridiculous, yeah. it's crazy. Um, well, that, so, so I would say, like, especially with you know, um, backer kit launch being mm-hmm. a way for you to reach out to all of your back people that have filtered through backer kit over the past years, you know, mm-hmm. and through other projects. At least for us, like, we find backer kit launch to be a very valuable tool. In oh yeah, yeah, in launch Marshall is wonderful. And, Still using yeah. launch, it's great. And and so, you know, to me, I would say like, well, um, it, like 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 to me, I think it's interesting that they're that they're not that they have yet to find a way or maybe they've just chosen not to. But they've they've opted to not find a way to promote people when they do backer kit marketing. They're not promoting to the literally hundreds of thousands of emails that they have internally at this point. Right. Right. Like, um, a backer kit monthly newsletter that they say, mm-hmm. hey, you know, if you if we accept you as a client, then, you know, we only have so many spots because we put you in the monthly newsletter and we feature you on the site and we put you at the end of, you know, when people fill out a survey, we could put you as like a mm-hmm. promoted project right there. Um, right. You know, like these different aspects to. Well, they didn't say that they would refuse to do that. I just said, oh, how come you guys don't do this? And they said, I don't know. That's a good question. We're going to look into that. Yeah, And then it just seemed like a no brainer because like, again, like you said, millions of people are going to that platform every day because their Kickstarter project ended and now they need to spend some more money on shipping. It just seems like it would make so much sense to be like, hey, check out these other projects currently on crowdfunding by Backerkit. Yep, exactly. And, and, And that's that's the crazy like I think Kickstarter, like if you look at metrics, especially if you're a small indie company, if you look at metrics, uh, when you do a Kickstarter page, you'll see that like you're going to see some amount of movement, some amount of sales from, you know, projects or Kickstarter referrals or Kickstarter mm-hmm. recommends, which is literally right. somebody backed a different project. And <laughs> once they got through the backing process, Kickstarter says, great job, you backed this project. Here's three more that you might like. Or when they logged in on the, when you come to Kickstarter, you know, and you first go to the homepage, they say, here's three projects that we recommend for you. Right. Um, or, you know, like like Kickstarter is very good about saying we keep an eye on what type of projects you spend money on and mm-hmm. we want to we are going to refer. And that is all based off algorithms. Right. So they're seeing, yeah. oh, Nick's project as actually like it, it hit five grand in the first two days or whatever. It's got a little bit of leg here. And and the algorithm saying and there's. There's 20 people that are that are hopping on that have hopped on today that have bought from Nick before or have bought other tarot decks. So the algorithm is kicking in. It's nobody on Kickstarter's end. It's just the algorithm mm-hmm. saying we need to put Nick's projects that are selling to Nick's people in front of more people because it's probably going to sell. Right. Um, and I look at Backer Kit and I say Backer Kit is getting you know is this great filter where everybody's coming through. Um, it, they could be doing some great things with all of that data that they've acquired and maybe they are it's just like um i I, i've yet to hear that like yeah i've yet to hear from a creator that they really feel like backer kits marshalling their own resources they're just uh uh you know utilizing their own expertise to do facebook ads or yada 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 so or they're helping you build campaigns to market to the people that are already in your email list right my guess is there's probably some legal reasons why like they're not allowed to market to someone else's email list that's stored on their servers so like in that regard it kind of makes sense and then 
<laughs> put, a, put a checkbox at the yeah. end of every survey that says, I understand that back of has the right to take my email. Done, right? Like, yeah. nobody's not going to check that box, right? So, yeah. Yeah. And so, but Backerkit also, as a crowdfunding platform, had some really cool tools. Um, okay. Yeah. So, like, they have this thing that you can institute called a launch party, which mm-hmm. is basically live streaming. So, you can live stream before your project launches and everyone's like all on the same page while you hit that launch button. Great yeah. if you want to strum up some things. Uh, nobody came to our launch party. Uh, uh, and then there's also you can have um forums in there you can have uh, diaries journals a whole bunch of different like it's almost like a patreon that happens alongside your project which was pretty mm-hmm. cool and mm-hmm. you can choose to make some things public or not public but after i did that and i started like building my next thing on kickstarter i was excited to see that kickstarter finally added the sections to a a, a project story so that was yeah. huge there's so many nice features. So Kickstarter got a new <laughs> director um, last year, right? Okay. And it was like, it was like, there, we have been asking for certain things for mm-hmm. years. Not, not, not unreasonable things, right? A sandwich bar <laughs> for your Kickstarter <laughs> page, right? Yeah. Uh, a reward tier page or tab that lets people just go straight to rewards without scrolling down. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, images next to add-ons. Like these are things that have been, hey, it's not hard. I don't know how to do it <laughs> on your program, but I'm sure that you do and I would love it, right? Yeah. And we've been asking for years. And literally this guy came in and within like two months, <laughs> everything was firing. I'm like, either that dude is like the most ma- motivational person of all time and just like mm-hmm. inspired that crew to execute or everything was clogged and he cleared the the bottleneck. And either way, I just like who, yeah. how, why or how that happened. We got so many great features this year that, that were a long time coming. Well, let, let's move into uh, Zine Quest. Tell me about the projects you're representing that are be coming out. They're coming out for Zine Quest, and that's all of February, is it? It's all February. Yep they they clarified this year that Zine Quest is for projects that launch in February. Um, okay. It used to be that as long as you were running at some point and you touched in February at some point, it was fine. Mm-hmm. But it, you have to launch in February now. Um, you you get the Zine Quest tag, um, and they will promote it to a minimal extent throughout this month. Um, it's kind of like uh, we probably talked about this before, but it's kind of like a um, uh, festival online for Zine enthusiasts. So what you'll see is that the number of backers increases during. February. Hmm. Um, people back more projects in February, um, especially in the first half of February, where they still have money to spend. But hmm. but it's a great thing because it's a kind of a fun event. Back typically, creators will you know cross promote with other creators that they really like. You know, there's different Facebook groups and Discords where we're kind of collaborating on different things. So it's kind of like this big fun festival of a of an event, and um, it makes it one of my favorite months of the year. Um, so on our end, um, let me see here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six projects that we are heavily in or involved in to, to one extent or another, um, for Zane Quest this year. Um, my, my wife and, uh, her business partner are doing a solo play journaling RPG called Terra Arcus, uh, which is this like crazy, um, playing card driven um, mechanics where you are entering the world of Celtic Fae and you're, mm-hmm. you know, having dealings with leprechauns and you're, you know, you're, you know, depending on how those uh, things go, you're progressing backwards or forward through the different phases of the moon. And like, there's all sorts of cool stuff. So like journaling RPGs, that's cool. Literally all I did was be really excited that my wife made a cool RPG that had like helped with the Kickstarter side of it. Um, but, but that's been really cool. Um, uh, John Baldisberger, our, our friend has been on your show before. Uh, he's doing mm-hmm. a project, uh, that we're helping with, uh, in, in small ways, um, really just helping promote it and helping with some of the fulfillment, but called overgrowth, which is, um, which is about wizards and going after, or, or wizards slash, like I'd say like druidic wizards going up against like corporate frustration and corporate overgrowth uh, so it's this weird map 
folding map of an RPG like folds out and you have all these crazy this crazy map of, of details and all sorts of things that are going on and, and you're using your wizards and all the rules for it are on the back of the map, similar to a project he did last year. John does gonzo crazy weird stuff, but um, it's really cool. Um, and it's a cool form factor to do a folding map like sort of thing. Um, and then we've got a couple of other clients that are doing um, more standard zine. So we've got Jeff Jones doing um, a New Gary's Appendix, which is uh, uh, a D&D OSR inspired uh, zine of different articles written by a host of people. Um, one of them is me. And then I help him with his Kickstarter page as well. Jeff's a great guy, does really great projects, and he's a fun collaborator. So I, I write for all his a lot of his zines, and, and it's really fun to, to participate. Um, then we got the Realms of Elgrun crew are doing an expansion to their box set RPG that they put out last year with us. Uh, so they've got a uh, new adventure zine as part of it, but they also have a new thing called a raid zine um which is kind of really fascinating realms of elgrun is trying to like bridge the gap between rpgs and video game audiences and so they're bringing in a lot of mechanics and ideas that are very very popular in the in the video game side of things but haven't fully made the leap into rpgs tabletop and so they've got like this cool raid mechanic and, and build that they uh that they're introducing there um, and we're helping with their Kickstarter page and printing and fulfillment on that. Um, and then the kind of the two that I have the heaviest hand in are um, a mothership project called Two Insanity and Beyond, um, <laughs> which is a, a delightful title. Deli I, I'll, that one is um, my doppelganger, um, call him Shadow Zach, the other Zach. Um, <laughs> it's kind of his birth child, but... Um, he had me write a good chunk of it with him. It's this, uh, it's three different adventures for the mothership sci-fi horror system that really deal with, uh, sanity and madness in different weird ways. So think like event horizon, um, or, um, I, well, I, I'll let the Kickstarter age explain it, but think like that sort of like weird gonzo wild, um, sci-fi concepts kind of packed into, uh, a single Kickstarter, so that one's really, really fun. It's been we I wrote on it last year actually, and so it's been fun to get to bring that to Kickstarter and work with Zach and work with Andrew and work with Eric and Greg, the other people that participated. Um, um, my adventure is um, and I promise I we won't get into the weeds too much here. But, <laughs> uh, my adventure, I, I I love the idea of what is it like to try what would it be like to try as a as a ship and their crew to spiral down uh the the pull of a black hole mm -hmm. and to move past the event horizon and into the singularity and what is the experience of trying to keep a ship together and trying to keep a crew together in that descent as mm. weird wildness happens and um um, what 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 ha what does it look like on the other side? And so that's called um, Blue Infernum, and the concept is you know um, uh, if 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 hell is fire and red, then Infernus is a black hole and cold and and dark deep blue. And so it's kind of like it, there's nine layers of this spiral. It's like the nine layers of hell, but they've all been interpreted into a sci-fi space. Um, black hole um interaction uh, yeah i had a lot of fun with that uh and then the last one um which is very new and very cool is there's a creator that i really adore his name's diogo diogo has written a ton of different rpg things uh, across quite a few companies but his own rpg is called primal quest which is like weird stone age fantasy like maybe like weird sci-fi weird science fantasy but in a stone age setting that's probably the best way it's like spaceships and artifacts and dinosaurs and you know you know stone age humans um 
And so we're he uh, uh, Diogo is in Brazil. He's a Brazil creator. He has a hard time creating Kickstarters because Brazil doesn't, you know, Kickstarter doesn't work that way um, in in that country. So we're helping him make it. And um, he was nice enough even before this to ask me to write uh, one of the first official expansions to Primal Quest. Um, and so I'm writing a hex crawl called um, uh, Crimson Water, which is a um, it's inspired by a lot of things. But one of the big things that's inspired by is I live in Kansas um, and I love dinosaurs. And so I said, you know, if I get to write a expansion for Primal Quest, I, I'd love to write a, a, a hex crawl centered around what Kansas used to look like, you know, in the. Cretaceous period, which is we were a massive inland sea, right? It was all underwater, and we had plesiosaurs and mosasaurs and all sorts of stuff going nuts. So, um, my crimson water is a inland sea expansion for their for his game. Man, there are so many cool things happening on Zine Quest. Like I'm looking at the list now, and like a lot yes. of these banner images so like when i have an idea for a project first thing i do is make a banner image and i'm yeah. like okay this will be like my thematic thing as i build other stuff from it and so yeah. many of these are just like just gorgeous pieces of art and so yeah. like inspiring yeah it's it's and, yeah. jaw dropping sometimes right like just um how they're how they execute um oh yeah there's some really cool stuff in here. And and uh, like so comparing Zine Quest from my experience to say uh Witch Starter, which is like when Kickstarter tries to promote the like tarot and metaphysical stuff. Mm -hmm. The items that people are usually pledging for during Witch Starter are a lot more expensive than the items that people are using pledging for during Zine Quest. So mm -hmm. it is easier to hit your funding goal in Zine Quest because it's usually lower. While in right. Witch Starter, you're looking to get a couple thousand dollars for a tarot deck if you did the art yourself. If you didn't do the art yourself, you're looking for $15,000. Yeah. So I, I did a project, a tarot project during Witch Starter, and I feel like if I hadn't done it during that month, I would have made more money. Hmm. But I didn't get that same feeling during Zine Quest because Zine Quest, people are looking to get tons of cheap little books. So if you have a small idea, a small project, it's really a great way to try and to get that thing made because like yeah. there's projects that like i mean if you're just printing an eight page zine maybe you only need 150 dollars you know yeah. so yeah. it's it's really it's, fun seeing these ideas in here yep and and it's a great like zines are a great way of getting those small mm -hmm. ideas out there or those weird ideas out there um like one of the ones that i keep seeing uh, that i'm excited to check out when it launches is called be kind rewind a video store journaling rpg mm -hmm. and i'm like i i like um, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to be for me or not at the moment, but like that, that, that is yeah. exactly the type of project that belongs in Zine Quest. And I want to see like, what is their vision for what that actually looks like? Um, uh, because you know, uh, like journaling RPGs are pretty cool and I don't have a lot of them and it'd be, you know, that might be something that, that really connects and, um, you know, um, anyhow. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. sometimes, sometimes it's better to avoid Zine Quest if February, if you're launching something that's bigger, because like you said, people are looking for that cheap thing that they can throw money at. Yeah. But if you've got a small idea, the Quest is great. Like I'm seeing one here that the art style is done like IKEA instruction manuals. Mm hmm. <laughs> Card Fangal Shelha. Nice. Uh, and then Thrifty Trades of Fae is a beautiful cover. It's about thrift shopping with fairies. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome oh there's the that's be kind awesome. rewind i'm gonna hit the button on that one yeah, yeah. like it's like like um and there's th th there's another site uh that i would recommend you check out <laughs> um that that is a that's big for me um it, it it's moved around a little bit i'm just gonna see if i can tell you the link live right now but um um it's called zemo is the site and the website itself is called uh zine month dot spread dot name because it's a placeholder site until they get their other <laughs> site back up but but, mm -hmm. but zemo is the uh, the more gen general verbiage uh but zine month dot spread dot name is where you can go to one website that's not kickstarter it's not game found it's not indiegogo that's not anything but it they compile 
all of the zines from February and from mm. the wider, um, uh, com- you know, crowdfunding community. And it's sortable. It's sortable by system. It's sort if you just want original systems or indie systems, or if you're a big fan of Morkfork or Mothership or D and D. Like you can sort by all these sorts of things. You can sort by platforms. Uh, you can sort by status. So if you want to see things that are upcoming only or live only, like these are different things that you can do that way. Um, you can sort by things like, is this physical? Is this digital only? Is this like, uh, like, like John's is in there as a folding map. So like mm-hmm. there's different, anyhow, I really like that site just because it kind of cuts through everything and says, here's everything in one place and it's only zines. So go nuts. Cool. Oh, um, I just remembered something I didn't tell you too. So with my new Kickstarter project that I'm, uh, well, I've got, I moved women's wheel over to Kickstarter. So I've got that launching February 5th, actually next Monday. Mm. And then uh, my uh, horror terror deck thing is yeah. starting February 19th. So I reached out to backer kit marketing to see if they could help me with the, uh, the terror, the giallo terror deck. And they said that they've shifted and now they'll only help with marketing on a project that it is expected to make over a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars mm-hmm. and already has at least 10,000 people on the email list. Yes. So that's that was a surprise. And so I said, well, what if I moved the project to backer kit? And they said, well, then we'll have lower requirements. So I might still try backer kit for possibly like a small zine or something as like a test to see how it goes over there. But I, mean, yeah. I don't know why they would want to market a small zine on backer kit. But, you know. Yeah, it's interesting. So that that kind of like uh, all, all. One of the things that I find very. I understand why they do it. Like uh, their mm-hmm. business and they got to make money and they got to, they got to right, find yeah. ways of making, maximizing their margins of profit. Right. But on the flip side, I definitely look at a statement like that and say, great. So I need to be independently successful hmm. before, before you are willing to sh- share in my success. Right. Uh, yeah. Which I think a lot of people, uh, you know, um, maybe not, maybe not uh, you or I, uh, certainly you and I at other times, are like, hey, I don't, I can achieve a, a success up to a certain point, but I'm looking at someone who can help me that we can, you know, one and one can equal four instead of one and one equals two, right? I want, I'm looking for somebody that can help me with marketing to push my project even further. And when I hear a, it, they're not the first company that I've talked to that's like, hey, you have to basically be on target to make a, to either have a, massive email list or or be on target to make up you know hundred thousand dollars or you have to have a project that you've already done that has made a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars and at that point i say well i think i've already figured it out when we when we get to those numbers yeah so it's Um, like i i feel like so you've had a few projects that have broken a million dollars right Yes, that I've consulted on. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. And did those use marketing or was that all organic? They use marketing. Um, Yeah. I will say, though, like, um, I'll I'll, I'll not say the name of the project, but I'll say that (laughs) I'll talk about the experience. Like, we use GameFound for one of the ones that I consulted on. Not my (laughs) decision, but it it was interesting. And GameFound uh, gave us a marketing budget. Of, I'll just say five figures, a five figure budget that they were going to, that they committed to spending on promoting our project. Mm-hmm. Um, what we found is what our, our best estimates on that game, which broke a million, was that we probably lost 20 to 25% of our sales if we would have gone to Kickstarter instead. So do the math and it's pretty easy to calculate there. If you do, mm-hmm. let's just say a million dollars, well, 20% of that is 200,000 and they gave us a five figure promotioning package it wasn't worth it right mm-hmm. um but also what we found is that over 97% of all of our backers and this was for a board game on gamefound which gamefound is like the alternative to kickstarter for board games right, um, right. 97% of all of our backers had never backed up game found project before so uh, we were we were backer kit or or, sorry game found was not providing an audience for us we were providing an audience for game found right i believe that that's truly what is happening across every site other than kickstarter right now Mm -hmm. 
we are being asked, creators are being asked, publishers are being asked to bring our community to this platform. And my my view on that very strongly is that, that is on, you should only be doing that if that platform is committing tangible committing tangibly committing to bringing their audience to you as well and they mm. have numbers to support that Interesting. Uh, because you and i are going to lose money going to any platform other than kickstarter um there's no way around that at this point we don't uh, so if we're if the only reason that we would move is if they say hey you have a mailing list of ten thousand people that's great, but we'll we'll supplement that with a email list of a hundred thousand backer kit or game found people. Well, that's a pretty good gamble to say I get a hundred thousand yeah. extra people, but I'm but you know, and I'm but I'm definitely risking having a smaller project on a smaller platform. That's a pretty good risk. But if you're saying I have to move my hundred my my ten thousand people to you, but you're not moving anybody to me, then I think the math pretty much checks out that I'm going to make less every single time. Um, and I would I love why, to have. Ahead, I don't know sorry. why I didn't. Th- I don't know why I didn't think of it that way when it came to the approach to using backer kit. But well, and you know, the reality is, like, I would love to see some alternatives to Kickstarter that are real, right? Like, I think the best, the best case scenario for all of us. The reason that Kickstarter didn't, uh, one of the reasons that Kickstarter didn't release features for years was because they didn't need to. They had no real competition, right? Right. Um, Competition in this case actually help is helpful, um, so I'd love that. But I think the only way that that's going to work out is if the majority, or at least a large swath of the big creators, all move out of Kickstarter and into these other fields and bring their audiences with them. If they, if you know, if you have RPG creators, RPG publishers, the big ones, going to crowdfunding by backer kit regularly to where there is every single week multiple big projects funding on backer kit then the audience mm-hmm. is going to start to shift over there and it makes sense for the right. little guys to start shifting too but right now our shifts isn't going to you know that's not going to move the marketplace it's not going to move the community and all it does is you know says we're going to give backer kit or game found five percent of ten thousand dollars as opposed to giving kickstarter five percent of $25,000 or whatever, right? So I think when I do my my um, my um next board game that I'm working on with my wife, Propagation Station, I might do that on, on backer, on crowd, sorry, on game found. Uh, uh-huh. Just for comparison's sake, because it is a board game, it would be safe there. Uh-huh. But... Safer, yeah. Yeah, but I feel like I game would... found is really for people who are gamers, while Kickstarter is for people who are gamers as well as people who are not gamers. And because it's That's about correct. propagating house plants, there's kind of like two markets, and half of that market would be gone if I went to Game Found. Yeah, and and I think my statement to everybody there is going to be: I think it, I think it'd be cool. Like I want, I actively think it'd be cool if you had propagation on Game Found. I think you you would be fascinated i think you personally would be fascinated to see all the tools and ui that gamefound has to offer right um if i was going to go over there i would say gamefound what are you going to give me that's mm. going to make i estimate that on kickstarter i can do you know thirty thousand dollars for this game i estimate that on gamefound i'm probably going to do 15 what are you going to do to help me make up that difference right um mm. Because they can't, they got they got resources. They can do it. Uh, yeah, they might ask me how to prove, ask me to prove how I'd make thirty. Because I haven't oh, done. Let's... Yeah, but whatever. <laughs> whatever you know, whatever you do the math. I mean, like we can, yeah. you know, like that's not it's not impossible, right? Like we can, yeah, whatever that math looks like, right? But to say like we think that we can get this many followers on this page and we can do this amount. Um, and the reality is that um, GameFound knows that they make less money. The third-party creators that aren't Awakened Realms makes less money on GameFound than they do on Kickstarter. You don't mm. have to prove that to them. It's a true fact. Um, so it's about, it's not about you having to prove it to them. It's about them having to prove to you that they're more valuable than the, than the, than the mass, than the mass appeal of Kickstarter. So at well, least that's my opinion. <laughs> I mean, lots of good stuff for me to think about here, but I have, I know we've already been going for like an hour and 17. 
I do have one last thing I wanted to ask you, and that is, uh, so I recently did a live episode of this podcast, um, Mm -hmm. live streaming here, and I had it connected to my YouTube and my Facebook, and huge failure. My computer could Mm -hmm. not handle the live streaming, and I have a very nice, (laughs) very expensive computer, but you live stream all the time. How do. do you do it? So I use uh, two programs. Um, uh, one is going to be very familiar to anybody who messes with video, which is OBS. I pretty much only use OBS to filter my camera. Um, that's literally all I do is I, 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 I fine tune my camera settings through OBS and I start the virtual camera, right? And mm-hmm. then I use Streamlabs to stream. Um, Streamlabs is free. It is, it's like a simpler version of OBS. It has a lot of templates. Um, you log into Streamlabs, you connect it to your Twitch account or your YouTube account or your Facebook account or wherever you're streaming to. Um, and, um, then you can pull in a source. So I, multiple sources, just like an OBS. So I pull in my OBS camera feed or whatever, and I pull in my mic and I pull in my headset and I pull in whatever. Um, and then the cool thing about Streamlabs that I really like is um, it takes a little bit of time, but you can connect through one login, your Twitch, your YouTube, and your Facebook, and whatever else you might have streaming-wise site set up. And then with one Go Live button, it broadcasts to all of those at the same time. Wow. And so, you know, Twitch is the, Twitch is the destination that you want for your live audience. Um, YouTube doesn't really do live very well, uh, unless you are, you already have a big following. Um, so Twitch is where you want to put your live broadcast YouTube. You might as well, but the cool thing about, you know, Twitch, it deletes everything after a few weeks, um, with YouTube, it'll archive your live footage for forever. Um, so that's handy that, that where you always have the backup and, and it's available for people to watch later. And then Facebook, it's just great content to put on, to have streaming directly to your Facebook page. Uh, so it's just one more thing that you're not having to think about that's adding content to keeping your page fresh. So it's really as simple as that. I don't have a crazy computer either. I bought a, you know, I bought a computer, uh, six years ago and I haven't upgraded anything since. So I don't know if you're how how techy you are i'm not but um i bought a nice computer six years ago and it's it still handles all of that streaming just fine so for me i think the biggest issue was just this platform that i'm using riverside fm i'm Mm -hmm. starting to learn the the features that like it was designed for versus the features they threw in because they had to throw it in and i think live streaming is part of that like one thing that's great about this platform is when this episode's done, the AI will automatically adjust all of our voice levels. It'll automatically generate TikTok clips with subtitles put on them with graphics. It'll automatically generate an entire YouTube video for me, and it'll automatically generate all the transcription. So I have to spend maybe no more than 30 minutes to an hour editing it all and uploading everything and scheduling it. Yeah. Which is That's nice. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. I'll no, no denying that that's a really handy feature. Um, that the, the, you know, and, and different programs can do different things. Of course, I will say that like the nice thing about running through Streamlabs slash OBS is that I can adjust levels in mm-hmm. those programs on its own. Right. Like, yeah. like I could like, that's handy. Now, I will say that when we stream and we do a podcast recording, a lot of times what I'll also do is we use um, Zencaster. It's very mm-hmm. similar to Riverside FM. Um, but Zencaster allows us to, we'll, we'll pull it up. It's browser based. You send in bytes just like Riverside, right? Um, and it records to multiple um, tracks. So there would be a Nick yeah. track and a Zach track, probably the same as Riverside, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and what that does, and it has a lot of the same features that you do there. So, I'll, But we don't do any video at all through Zencaster for the exact same reason that you oh. just mentioned through Riverside. We only use it okay. for audio recording. Um, and it's just a backup and a way of getting cleaner audio for the podcast. But for the live stream, we're like, I'm not worried about the live stream being clean. It's live, right? So. <laughs> Um, so just put it through a program that, like you said, is designed to do it. Um, 
as opposed to... So Streamlabs to... is software uh, that runs off the computer, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, Free software. So... You can get yeah. it at no cost. Um, and, yeah. you know, it, you know, it, then you just, well, as soon as you download Streamlabs, it's going to say, hey, what platforms do you want to stream to? It's going to ask you to log into those platforms mm-hmm. that connects them. And then you just build out the scenes, like, um, mm-hmm. you know, with... And, Interesting. And, you can do. You can download like a really. Uh, re- there's a lot of really cool overlays. I've never made a, a a my own overlay completely from scratch. I've always gone on, downloaded a free one, and then modified it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can do. You can get ninety percent of the work done by somebody else, and then you come in there and say, "Yeah, but I want I want you know uh, the uh, uh, art for profit sake logo over here, and I want it in these colors, and I want to do mm-hmm. this, and you know tweak it, and you're done." Um, I think I built a new overlay for a new channel that we're going to do uh, the other night. And it took me like picking an overlay, modifying it and getting the multiple scenes set up took me about two hours. On, mm-hmm. on stream. So it's not a, not a big time investment. Um, hmm. I'll look into that, but I'm thinking if I'm using Riverside just for audio, then I won't be able to generate those TikTok clips and the, the YouTube thing. But I guess the YouTube's which, not as important if I'm live streaming to that. Which and 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 it, it it might be interesting to see like I'm a dumb person Nick especially when it comes <laughs> to this right it might be that somebody that's smart would say well Zach you can you can get all of that on Streamlabs too you just have to yeah. like, look, use your eyes and it's right there so so <laughs> Zach uses things Zach likes using things at the base level like can I get in here and do a thing and it works? Yes. Great. And then I may never look at any other feature on the <laughs> entire thing ever again. Right. I feel like you are way better at like, like you've sent me some links to a few different types of like 3d modelers and things like that. I'm like, dude, you know, like that's a great tool and you, you figured it out like at a level that I probably never <laughs> would have. So, yeah. Well, um, in that regard, you've given me a lot of stuff to research. Uh, people who want to fuck with your shit, um there's wogd w-o-g-d.com world of game design uh w-o-g-d.com again you're yep. gonna be at origins as well as many other events uh mm-hmm. you're also on the wandering monster podcast that's baldisberger john baldisberger Shit, sorry, point, sorry. Oh, that's fine that's fine no you yeah. should you should give them a plug uh geeks so camp. we do the sorry we do the yeah. geeks camp podcast yep um and you can go on wogd uh, twi- uh youtube.com forward slash wogd live all our world of game design, or you can go on twitch.tv forward slash Wogby live. Uh, if you want to catch some of the live streams, um, as we, as we do those, um, and if you want to check out all the cool product, we talked about all the cool product, you can go to store.wogby.com and, and see all of that there. So does the, the Wogby.com uh, or store.wogby.com, does that list any of your zine quest projects that you're working on? No, uh it probably could slash should but again yeah, zach's a dumb should. person and <laughs> it, it doesn't i well i will say that there are promotions on there for some other projects that we have upcoming but i don't currently have oh, yeah, a cool. scene quest up uh, uh on the on the slideshows of promotions <laughs> that are going through there that would be a good cool. call maybe i'm going to do that after we get on there well i definitely <laughs> want to hang out with you and the uh walkie Please. guys at origins um so uh, not just the panel. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll grab a beer or something. So you're in tacos. <laughs> that's, that's the origins plan all day, every day. So nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I got, uh, I don't know anyone who's going to be there other than you and maybe I'll run into one or two people, but, uh, it'll be fun. I'm excited. <laughs> Thanks a lot for having me on again, Nick. Thanks again so much. I mean, I know we went for an hour and a half and we could go for five. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll save it. Yeah. Right. Thanks Zach. Art for Profit's Sake is recorded through Riverside FM, distributed through Spotify for Podcasters, and edited on Adobe Audition. The music is provided by Old Romans. If you learned anything useful or found this podcast helpful, please rate and review us five stars. If you want to learn more about me or my art, head over to chainassembly.com. Hi, it's Nick here. If you're a fan of my work, then I know you either like tarot, horror films, or both. My latest project is a tarot deck inspired by Italian Gothic horror films of the 60s and 70s. Referred to as giallo films, their movie posters were known for their dramatic and bold graphic design choices. I'm bringing that same aesthetic to a new Rider Waite style tarot deck that I call Tarocchi Gialli, where each card is lovingly crafted to look like a film poster from the era. It's launching on Kickstarter February 19th. 
To learn more about the project, follow me on Instagram at ChainAssembly or visit www.chainassembly.com.